there are a lot of things that Double Zeta Gundam is. It's fun, it's charming, it's exciting, it's dramatic, and it's also slow. It's a tonal whiplash. It's nonsensical, it's crowded, and I might even say it can be a little boring. But if there's just one thing that Double Zeta isn't, it isn't a bad Gundam anime. The last time I spoke about Gundam, I went on about how great of a sequel Zeta was. And today I'm going to talk about how good Double Zeta is. Gee, that's inspiring, you know, way to hook viewers in. I'm sure that every one of you is so excited to hear about this story now. But wait, before you leave, let me offer you a little something, a sliver of hope, a bribe, if you will, that might actually get you a little invested in what I have to say. Everyone is wrong about Double Zeta Gundam. Ooh, a little controversial. Have I piqued your interest now? Well, sit back and enjoy my rambling for the next half an hour or however long this video is going to go for while I talk about this not so beloved Gundam entry that still deserves all of your attention. Double Zeta is kind of the ugly middle child stuffed between two of the most iconic and highly acclaimed Gundam series out there. It, quite frankly, is the daunting 47 episode final boss standing right between you and Char's counterattack. Now some might say, don't worry about it, just skip Double Zeta, it's bad. Just blissfully go off and watch Red Man commit war crimes in a really cool looking mobile suit while he fights the other jaded war-torn man in an even cooler mobile suit. And to that I say, sure, you could do that. I mean, Char's counterattack in a way is its own standalone movie. It could be the only Gundam you ever watch and still walk away having a great experience. So if you're really just frothing at the mouth to go and see what all the excitement's about, Go, do it. But just know, if you do, that post-char clarity is going to hit you like a brick. And you'll wish you let that journey fester just a little bit longer. And where will that bring you? Right back to Double Zeta Gundam. So what's the rush? If you enjoy what Gundam has to offer, relax and enjoy it. Yes, Charles Counterattack is a really damn cool and beautifully animated movie. That is the culmination of everything we've seen thus far. But again, what's the rush? Now I guess you could absorb a lot of the key moments in Double Zeta through this video essay, but even if you do, I'd still recommend you go off on your own and watch the whole series for yourself anyway, because I can't cover anything and inevitably there's going to be so much that's missed. Instead, just think of this video as accompanying material or even just a vessel to recap and explore the themes and characters of Double Zeta just that little bit deeper. Oh, and of course, it might just help you to appreciate the series a little bit more by the end. I know me making these videos certainly does that for me. Now, where do I even begin? with Double Zeta. That right there and even this right here is what you could call tonal whiplash. And it's the exact thing that most people feel when they first start Double Zeta right off the back of Zeta Gundam's bleak finale. But here's the thing, whether you like that or not, it's pretty apparent that it was intended. I mean, for starters, just look at the release date. Double Zeta literally started airing to its audience the week after Zeta Gundam finished. So that whiplash is the closest mutual experience you and a Japanese kid from 1986 will ever have, which in its own way is actually kind of cool. Usually in anime, the age of characters is pretty stupid and kind of arbitrary. I mean, look at Jojo's for example. But in Double Zeta, our main cast being around 14 to 15 feels a lot more deliberate and just further goes to reflect this new tone the series is taking. Think about it for a second. Back when you were 15 and in school, did you take anything seriously? When you were told off by a teacher or when your whole year group was brought into an assembly to get told off by the principal because of how some people might have acted on the bus in school uniform and how that's such a bad representation of the school, you're telling me you didn't just side-eye your mate and really just have to try your hardest to not let out a fucking laugh or 
managed to hold it in and just let it all out afterwards. And if it wasn't you, I'm sure you can recall at least some other kids just taking the absolute piss out of it. Because unless there are actual tangible problems like people being hurt or someone disrespecting the bus driver, of course, you're just gonna have a laugh about it. It doesn't affect you and the reaction feels unwarranted, so screw what the adults say. Now, if you replace your principal, one of the largest authorities in your life at that time, with Captain Bright, one of the largest authorities of our main cast at the time, and replace fucking around in school with fucking around in a war, then you have the start to double Zeta Gundam that everyone seems to hate so much. Coming straight off the back of Zeta, the Argama is in a rough shape. Operating on a skeleton crew with Camille in, well, a state, and Far literally being the only mobile suit pilot left alive on board. Enter our new ragtag cast with protagonist, 14 year old Judao, his little sister, Lena, and similarly aged friends, El, Mondo, Beecher, and Eno. They notice the Argama's looking pretty worse for wear as it just docked in their colony Shangri-La. So of course, why wouldn't they take advantage and try to make a quick buck? These kids are junk dealers fending for themselves with no parents anywhere to be found. And the Zeta Gundam they spot could definitely make a pretty penny. Plus, it's not like they fully understand the gravity of war at this point outside of how it's personally affected them on Shangri-La. And when you consider their main motivation being trying to figure out where their next meal's coming from, which is in part due to the impact of war, why would these kids pass this opportunity up? And by extension, once all said and done, why would they have any respect for the military? Or any respect for authority for that matter when they've been left by quite literally everyone to fend for themselves? So they do exactly what you would expect these kids to do, steal the Gundam. People love to complain about kids stealing mobile suits, but here a lot of it feels pretty natural. The first time was amidst a skirmish featuring Yazan with a skeleton crew while repairs on the Argama were taking place, and the second time, Bright just lets it happen. You might say, that's dumb, and to you I say, you're dumb. The Argama's last remaining pilot is Far, and she is so absolutely worn out by the war she was just in and can't actually even pilot the Zeta properly. Now sure, Judao isn't perfect either, but considering the piloting ability that Bright saw from him in the first episode, as well as the prowess from all the new types he's seen over the years, you can see why he'd kind of trust his intuition here and just let the kid pilot the Zeta. Whether you like it or not, it just kind of makes sense and is really the only choice he has at this point if he wants to fight back against Neo Zeon. And Bright's intuition, once again, pays dividends. That isn't without a little resistance though. Bright gives Judao a pretty reasonable offer, that is one of stability. He can be a pilot aboard the Argama and never have to worry about where his next meal is coming from again. Plus, he'll be doing more honest work, as his sister Lena puts it. But Judao really likes his life as a freelancer. He doesn't want to be a quote-unquote salary man for the AEUG. And I get that. He's always had to fend for himself and there would be a lot of restrictions in place becoming a part of a war effort. It's a huge responsibility and quite frankly a risky one, but it would be the only stability he and his sister have ever had in their lives. So eventually, Judao comes around, even if it took a little bit of peer pressure. So not only does Bright convince Judao to join the Argama, he also gains all of Judao's friends and soon enough, Rue. All of which inevitably come together to create the Gundam team, consisting of the Gundam Mark II, Zeta, and the double Zeta Gundam, and later the Hyakushiki as well, I guess. Before we move on, I want to quickly circle back to the tone shift issue that people have with double Zeta. In case I wasn't clear enough on why I think everyone's wrong about this and why I think it was deliberate and all around kind of a good idea, consider this. Double Zeta is giving us a whole new perspective. These kids haven't gone through this whole journey with us. So of course, they aren't going to have all of these preconceptions that we do throughout Mobile Suit Gundam and Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. And by extension, that means they're not going to act the way we think that they should. But the way they act isn't abnormal, and I really want to hammer that point home. They're just acting like themselves, a bunch of young junk dealers doing whatever they can to survive. Even if that means leveraging the AUG for their benefit until their fight 
turns into their fight as well. Because we all know while the series starts like this, it can't be all sunshine and rainbows forever. We're going to slowly and progressively watch these kids lose their innocence as the show's tone slowly follows suit. And if you're still shaking your head in disapproval and I haven't yet convinced you and you're in my comment section writing some crap about how Double Zeta is the worst thing you see has ever put out, there's one final thing I can give you to consider. Mobile Suit Double Zeta Gundam was made, funded, and produced to sell merchandise. And the more gleeful tone we get to start probably made kids a little bit happier. And happier kids watching a slightly happier show probably consume more products, but that's just a theory. And of course, that's not to say that kids' shows cannot be emotionally mature and have to resort to joking around all the time. I think there is a fine balance and I think a series like Zoid's Chaotic Century really does nearly perfect that. It is stupid and nonsensical at some times, but also nails the more serious tone, but never gets so dark like Gundam does. And I think that's a really great platform to sell toys. But nonetheless, again, it can still be mature while selling toys, but the lighthearted nature really does help. So now that I've spent the last, I don't know, 10 minutes or so defending Double Zeta's humble beginnings, let's really delve into the meat of this story. Our new gang joins the Argama and is being pursued by Mashmir Sello, who sees himself as the sword to Haman's Neo Zeon, so to speak. And that is the best pronunciation of his name you're going to get. He will be Sello from now on. He's completely devoted to her cause to an absolute fault, which actually becomes quite tragic later on in the series, but we'll get to that. For now, he's just kind of a goofy villain. Similarly to Jared before him, he has a very one-sided rivalry with our protagonist, Judal. But unlike Jared, Cello is not that bad of a guy. Sure, technically he is on the wrong side of history here, but it'd be a stretch to call him evil. Yet. To be honest, we almost see more redeeming moments for him than we do some of our protagonists. He tries to take noble actions where he can, minimizing the impact on civilians and colonies when battles take place, and he's shown to really care about his crew, having multiple funerals throughout the show for all of the men he's lost. On the contrary, we've got two of our new cast, Beecher and Mondo, literally selling out the Argama to Zeon, which you would think would be unforgivable, but alas, it isn't which is honestly a huge flaw that a lot of people have a problem with and I'll admit does drag the series down a little bit and just goes to exacerbate yet another issue. Double Zeta is bloated with characters. This was kind of an issue in Zeta, but it was a little more manageable. However, in Double Zeta, I just couldn't keep up. By episode 10, once Chara Soon and Glemmy Toto show up, main characters like Bicha, Mondo, El, and Eno have all just faded into obscurity. Sure, by the end of the series, we do get to know them a little bit better, but I really believe that Double Zeta would have benefited from cutting a little bit of the fat and giving Beecher and Mondo some serious repercussions for the actions that they took would have been the perfect excuse to do that. Which is a little hard for me to say because I actually really appreciate how Beecher turned out by the end, but man, did I ever despise him in the start. But not like a Camille kind of dislike where he progressively grows and you can slowly get behind him by the end. Beecher just kind of sucks and then suddenly gets a lot better in the second half. I can't say I feel the same about Mondo, but at least there's a bit of a feeling there. I've got absolutely no feelings for, you know, that guy really just got shoved into the background and forgotten about. Sorry, little bud. So Far leaves the Argama to go be with Camille, and Chara and Glemmy both take over Cello as our new main antagonists. We also finally get the reveal of the Double Zeta Gundam, and I've got to say, it is easily the most impractical Gundam I have ever seen. The Double Zeta is made up of three core fighters that come together and transform into, admittedly, one beast of a Gundam, but far more times than not, the fact it needs to combine in this way becomes a real hindrance. Sure, I can point to like one time it comes in handy in the very final fight, but I can point to just so many times where it's put our gang in a real rough position because of it. Impracticality aside, it does look pretty cool and the transformation sequence is always nice to see on screen and boom, Glennie kidnaps Lena and we're off to Moon Moon. Yes, Moon Moon, everyone's favorite mini arc of Double Zeta and I'm here to give it all the time it truly deserves. 
So once the gang leave Moon Moon, we notice that Judao can't bring himself to fire when confronted with an actual pilot's face. When they're nameless drones in mobile suits, that's one thing, but this right here is one of the first real hits to Judao's psyche and a really good wake up call to the fact he is fighting a war right now. He then gets his second big wake up call when witnessing the absolute destructive power of the Agamas fresh and new hyper mega particle cannon, whatever the fuck, and decides to take off on his own to sneak into Axis and hurry up and save Lena. Because obviously a war fought with these kind of weapons could very easily have her caught in the crossfire and just killed at any moment. So I don't blame him for taking off here. He's got to hurry up. And this is where we get introduced to yet another character, the young new type girl, Peru. He feels quite a strong connection to Judao and pretty quickly defects from Zeon to join him. In Axis is also where Judao has his first face-to-face -face confrontation with Aman Khan, which of course is just as standoffish as you would imagine. Soon after the failed attempt to get Lena back, the gang end up on the moon for a very great and honestly emotional side story. That starts with Judea kicking Mr. Wong in the guts and meeting one of Therese's old friends, Cecilia. All the while making me feel stupidly nostalgic by playing the Zeta Gundam ending theme in the cafe. These guys really just know exactly how to pull at my heartstrings here and continue to do exactly that with Cecilia's story. She's in dire straits and needs some cash pronto. So she plays the role of a Xeon spy. But her biggest mistake was trying to play both sides. She ends up lying to Zeon about the Argama's location, which is all well and good, but there are also a lot of innocent people at the location she misdirected them to. And to make matters worse, Zeon's reward for all her troubles was a bomb in a briefcase. So with nothing else left in a final attempt to redeem herself, Cecilia decides to make the brutally tough decision to give Zeon back their bomb but it wasn't as badass as the scene I'm sure we're all thinking of. It was far more human because she is only human. She knew what she was doing, but she was still scared as hell doing it with tears gushing out of her eyes the whole time. She attaches herself and the bomb to an enemy mobile suit, which docks straight onto the Xeon ship and explodes with her still attached. Despite Judao's valiant attempt to save her after realizing what was going on, Torres is left blissfully unaware, thinking his old friend lived on and can start a new life on a colony somewhere. And Judao is left to wonder why she ever decided to take that burden on herself in the first place. That mini arc in and of itself honestly could have been its own war in the pocket OVA type story, it was that good. But we need to carry on with our descent into Earth, which weirdly enough is where a lot of people say the story picks up for them, but for me is kind of the point where it started to drag. Judao saves Peru, who was burning up upon a re-entry to Earth, in the same way that Camille did to Char way back when, which ends up really solidifying her switching to his side. Then we get three continuous episodes telling individual stories, reflecting on how the war has impacted those still on Earth. Which, don't get me wrong, I understand why a lot of people like them, for me, they just fell a bit flat and were kind of a snooze fest when compared to Cecilia's emotional story we just witnessed a couple episodes prior. Nonetheless, it does give Judao far more time to reflect on what he's even fighting for and if he should just stop the second he saves Lena. Xeon ain't shit, the Federation ain't shit, honestly, fuck this shit. But not quite yet because there's still like half the show left to go. Judao eventually tracks Lena down to a glorified cocktail party between Xeon and the Earth Federation where Haman is hosting and trying to organize peace and of course Judah once again comes face to face with her but this time she right pisses him off by taking a shot at Lena literally and Judah exerts this new type pressure that affects every other new type in the area and scares the absolute fuck out of Haman. She was already kind of keen on him but now her investment in this kid is deep rooted. In her mind, if she can get this kid on her side, she's already won. Now a lot of people have mixed opinions about her obsession with Judo. Fuck is it Judo? 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 Whatever. If it's Judo, you can fight me about it in the comments. I'm gonna level with you here. I don't think she was into him in that way. Now sometimes it might have 
seemed like it, but I think it's pretty easy to boil that down to simply being manipulation. I mean, she'd already achieved that kind of loyalty out of Cello, so who's to say that she couldn't pull it off with another young and impressionable guy? After all, she is a downright powerful woman and one of the best antagonists in Gundam. And if you have a look at literally any reddit thread talking about her, you can see that a lot of real life people would have been coerced by her. From Haman's perspective, she's only felt a new type pressure like this once before from Camille. And if she can harness that power for Neo Zeon's benefit, like I said a minute ago, she's already won. Unfortunately for her, Judao is far too strong willed for that kind of manipulation and fights her until the very end. But Let's not get ahead of ourselves yet. Lena is finally saved. Congratulations. And boom, she's dead. Well, at least that's what we're led to believe, but she comes back later. Judao is absolutely done at this point. I mean, why bother? He's lost the one thing he was trying his hardest to protect. And at this point, everybody seems corrupt. So to hell with it all. Rude tries to give Judao the tough love stance by saying, you know, not to let Lena die in vain. And although she's a bit of an ass for bringing it up right then and there, I mean, Jesus Christ, let the body go cold first. I can't really blame her. The Argama's ace pilot's number one motivation for fighting at all has just went up in flames, but there's still a water fight. So it's kind of hard to blame Rue for trying to rile him up instead of just letting him dwell. Out of all people, Beecher gets a bit of character development and actually says the mature thing here, telling Rue that everyone wants to be alone sometimes and that maybe she should just let him be. Nonetheless, she kind of ignores that, keeps pushing and confronts Judao, who's locked himself in one of the core fighters. Now, while I did say Rue was being a bit of an ass about it and I don't think she should have confronted Judao, as soon as she did in that kind of way. Now that the dust has actually settled and they're back on the Argama, I don't see a problem with her stepping up because although not the most conventional, it is her way of trying to help. Similarly to the way Edelgard reacts to Geralt's death in Fire Emblem Three Houses. But when he finally opens up the cockpit, it's a pretty confronting scene, especially for Double Zeta so far. The slow, somber jazz music sets in as we see Rue and Peru's reactions before the slow and painful reveal of Judao's bruised and bloody knuckles and the smashed up center console of the core fighter. He is going through it and understandably does want to be left alone like Beecher said. But his actions or rather inaction has consequences. He slowly realizes that Rue kind of had a point and picks himself back up to join the fight. But once he gets there, half the village that he could have protected is already destroyed. Had he just followed orders and not dwelled so much on his sister's death, so many more innocent civilian lives could have been saved. That's a hard pill to swallow and a stupidly tough position for anyone, let alone a teenager, to be put into. There's a real importance in mourning and by no means should Judao not have had that chance and time to mourn, but at the end of the day, the cost of that mourning is so many more innocent lives being taken. So it's really just unfair either way. Moving along, we soon discover it's pretty lonely at the top. Haman is struggling to do what she thinks is right alone. And in this moment of weakness, Glemmy starts turning the wheels of his uprising. He is a legitimate descendant of the Zabi family and we recently found out a lot of soldiers would consider him to be the true leader of Zeon and stand behind him because of it. And at this point is where Puru too finally comes into play. Puru herself was a very powerful and capable new type that was manipulated to fight directly under Glemmy. And in case anything happened to her, well, he made a backup. But we'll come right back to her and Glemmy shortly because in other news, Zeon is dropping another colony on Earth. That's right, Dublin is their next target and Captain Rakan is taking no prisoners, destroying each and every exit from the city of Dublin to trap as many people in the city as he possibly can. Plus, because the Earth Federation's higher-ups were too concerned with saving their own skin, they didn't even warn the citizens of an impending colony drop, so no one got an evacuation order at all. And the moment the colony hits the Earth is easily 
one of the craziest moments in the entire Gundam franchise. Because it doesn't just land and completely explode, this one is a slow and gruelling burn. With the Zaku 3 and Double Zeta left to fight amidst the burning rubble. And I mean, it's it, actually a really damn cool set piece. Just like, look at this. Within the aftermath, Camille awakens something in Judao, his fighting spirit. He feels the pain and emotion of everyone that was just killed in this colony drop. The same way that Camille felt after the colony gassing way back when. So he takes that motivation and runs with it, saving Prue from Prue 2, who's piloting the brand spanking new Psycho Gundam Mark II. Now, having both of these girls around is kind of confusing, and Tamino addresses that in the only way he knows how, by having one of them die. Prue sacrifices herself in a last-ditch effort to save Judao, but unfortunately, this is somewhat in vain. Her sacrifice can't even completely destroy the Psycho Gundam, and the scene of it all wrecked emerging from the shadows is easily one of the most menacing scenes in all of Gundam. It is all for show at this point though, as Junao really quickly destroys the thing before seeing Peru 2 in the cockpit, realizing that Peru just killed Peru. And I gotta say, this whole episode here, episode 35 where the colony drop happens, is easily one of my favourite episodes of Gundam, period. The atmosphere, the combat, Peru's death, some new type shenanigans, it's honestly beautiful and all Gundam's about. But now, we're in the end game, and it's time to head back to space and finish the fight. Fittingly enough, this is where Mash Cello is reintroduced in his Quattro Bajina inspired fit. He just orchestrated the colony drop on Dublin and is back in the spotlight as one of our antagonists, after having some cyber new type alterations. This is where all of his humanity is thrown to the wayside and a merciless soldier devoted to Haman is born. All the while, Captain Bright decides he's just too old for this shit and takes a leave of absence, leaving Beecher as the new acting captain of the brand spanking new Nail Argama. This is around where Beecher kind of flips into a pretty good character, slowly developing some competent leadership skills to become a pretty decent acting captain by the end. But it does kind of feel like we missed a very solid redeeming chunk of his character arc, where he goes through something and matures enough for Bright to trust him in this position. I mean, not so long ago, we just saw his ego get the best of him when he tried to show off in the double Zeta, nearly getting himself killed and losing their most powerful Gundam in the process. Yet now he's just put in charge of the AUG's flagship. We definitely missed something here, but more episodes probably would have been a bit of a burden, especially when I kind of believe we could have cut a few of the Earth side stories and maybe even shortened the beginning of the series already. But just giving Beecher some more development and character defining moments within the episodes we already have definitely wouldn't have gone astray. Nonetheless, with the Hyaku Shiki aboard, the Gundam team is finally at full power we are now headed to Dragon Colony. Just like every VIP room you see in Australia, this colony is decked out with dragon statues at the front and is made for high rollers only. Like the really creepy head honcho of this place that for some reason is trying to just create his own harem. So we get some white chicks shenanigans and Mondo's girl kind of spontaneously dies. I do have an explanation for this though, thanks to an old Reddit thread. What I've discovered is that this is actually a translation error and not some weird animation error that most people commonly think. What apparently happens here is Rosara using the last bit of her life force to push the mobile suit's foot away from Mondo as it was coming down, just like how she previously deflected the beam that was coming for his life in the Hyakushiki. But unfortunately, this pushed Rosara beyond her limit and abruptly ended her life. The falling rock to the side that we see is just some debris, and in actuality, it was her new type powers that killed her, which, as this person adds, really does help to build towards the Axis miracle we see in Char's counterattack. So you can wipe that one off your double Zeta bad bingo board. Continuing on, it is about time for Glemmy's coup. All starting with Pru 2 absolutely lighting up Minerva's safe house, and with that, in true Gundam fashion, we have our three-way conflict to end the series on. Glemmy has taken over Axis and literally everyone we've met throughout the series is heading there for this final battle. We've got Haman's side consisting of major players like Cello and Chara Soon. Glemmy's rebels consisting of Captain Rakan, Peru 2 and a bunch 
more undisclosed number of Peru clones. Thanks to Unicorn, we know it was at least 12 of them. And finally, our whole Neil Argama crew. Right off the bat, we get to see our early antagonist face off against our late game antagonist, which is pretty damn cool to see. Back on the Argama, and the crew is still kind of suiting up, getting ready for battle, and L is looking kind of down. And in this moment, Beecher kind of just confesses his feelings towards her, which is not only a great morale move as a captain, but also a really nice reversal of gender roles in goddamn 1986. L is about to set off for war, and now Beecher himself is a great motivator for her to come back alive, because she knows that she has someone who cares about her to return to. Cut to Judah, who's sitting in his cockpit and accepting the fact he may die out there, wondering if he's ever going to make it back to Shangri-La. With our emotional part out of the way, it's time for the fully sick Gundam team to launch, and it easily has to be one of the most menacing things a Zaku would ever have the horror of seeing. Back to the battle, and the first to hit the chopping block is our old friend Mashmir Sello, who gets trapped by Rakan and his squad, and sacrifices himself to take a couple of Rakan's men down with him. Only for Haman to sense his demise and think to herself, damn, I really just lost the resource, as she puts it. Which just goes to show how little she really thinks of her men, and how disposable everyone is to her goal. Glemmy finally makes his move, and launches the Queen Mansa alongside Peru too, because she's struggling to fight against Judao. And when the three of them finally meet, he actually makes a pretty good point to Judao. He says that he fights for what can't be achieved by any other means, and that he doesn't personally see any justice on Judao's side, so asks him why he even fights at all. And Judo has no answer to that question. Glemmy theorizes that Judao only fights because he's been dragged into this conflict, whereas he fights because it's his own choice and he won't regret that decision, and goes to tell Judao that he doesn't even have a reason for what he does. But the thing is, Glemmy doesn't understand Judao's feelings as a new type. He's literally feeling the pain from all sides of this war and just wants it to stop. He remembers Camille saying it's the injustice he sees and the anger he feels being his motivation in the first place, and reflects on when Far told him that Camille didn't fight because anyone ordered him to, but because he believed in the world's ability to redeem itself. And that is Judas' resolve, that is his reason for fighting. It's on behalf of everyone else that can't. He even goes on to monologue to Glemmy about how just because he can articulate his cause and reason for fighting better, that doesn't genuinely make it any better of a reason. And all I gotta say is right here, Judah really is just like me for real. I'm not always the best at articulating myself and I'm sure it does come across that way in these videos. And also goes to explain why scripting just takes me weeks on end. But regardless, I don't think that should dilute what I have to say. Carrying on, Peru 2 doesn't really resonate with Glemmy's sentiment, realizes she's kind of just being manipulated and gets the fuck out of there before Rue takes a shot at Glemmy, sniping him right out of the cockpit. And our second antagonist bites the dust. So now it is finally time for Judao to get out there and meet Haman face to face on the battlefield, to try and end this conflict between themselves and not cause any more bloodshed. Not before Chara soon goes out in an absolute blaze of glory against a couple of the Peru clones. Haman and Judao meet and continue to fight amongst the wreckage of Core 3, even getting into some traditional Gundam get out of your mobile suit hand to hand combat. Haman, even on the brink of really losing everything, still hasn't given up on trying to recruit Judao. In his eyes, she's just as bad as Glemmy, even telling her earlier on that he sees no difference between the two. Or more specifically, feels as though what Haman's doing would just yield the same results as what Glemmy was trying to do in the end. But Haman genuinely believes there is a difference and that she is in the right here. And although she had the entirety of Neo Zeon behind her, it was still lonely for her at the top. She didn't truly have an equal, until Judao came along. Someone who strongly contested her beliefs and couldn't be charmed by her power and her influence. She finally met her match. Now Neo Zeon is falling apart and she has nothing left but this final confrontation. She wants to make the most out of it and enjoy this fight so bad 
that she even refuses to use the Quibelli's funnels. And Judao raises a really good point here. That openness Haman has to tell him she won't be using the funnels, and that respect she has for him in this duel could have been used to promote harmony and protect the earth instead of dropping another colony on it. She snaps back at this idea, essentially echoing Char's belief that humanity is still weighed down by gravity, and basically aren't ready for that conversation. With nothing else left, after being defeated by Judao, with the assistance of all the new type ghosts of the past, channeled through Camille into the Double Zeta's biosensor, Amon Khan lets herself be taken in by the explosion and goes down with the heart of Xeon. Sure, she probably could have survived, but it was all over for her anyway, and there really wasn't much left for her to live for in the end. Judao narrowly escapes the explosion, the Federation show up to claim victory over Xeon, even though they made no effort in this fight, and kind of caused the whole issue to begin with making these shady underhanded deals with Haman. Understandably, when Judao sees this, he's pissed, gives Bright a massive jab to the face, then finally sees his sister Lena alive in the flesh again, and immediately leaves for Jupiter with Rue. Because really, what was it all for in the end? You can't blame the guy for wanting to get away from it all, and I'm sure he has a lot to think about, especially after those last few interactions he had with Glemmy and Haman. And in the end, we're left with the classic outro song starting before the outro to really hit us in the feels, and we're left with the cute scene of Far and Camille running happily on the beach, which honestly just makes it all worth it. So circling back to the very beginning, why is everybody wrong about Double Zeta Gundam? I mean, if you're watching the same video I just scripted, you might have that answer already. This series gets chucked aside, seen as a chore, or something that should just be skipped entirely. It's brutally reviewed by so many and hated by people that never even gave it the time of day. There's a large sum of Gundam fans that just have such a massive hate burner for the start of Double Zeta that they forget how brilliant it can be or never let themselves experience it. And if anything, the stark contrast between the start of the show and where we end up at the end is so much more impactful because of its humble beginnings. If anything, I almost feel sorry for those who can't find an appreciation for this series. It's not perfect by any means, but it is more than worth your time. And I hope with this video, I've been able to give you a new perspective on just how great Double Zeta Gundam can be and prove to you why everyone is so wrong about it. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching, and I, I don't think I've even mentioned it in a video yet, but thank you all so much for 5,000 subscribers. It was a really huge milestone for me that maybe I just didn't celebrate enough, but I guess we can all save the celebrations for when we get to 10k. So if you want to see that day, leave me a like, subscribe for more, and as always, have a great rest of your day. I'll see you all next time. Peace.